Okay, we might kick off and um, allow people to, to join um, probably in the coming minutes, but to those of you online already, a warm welcome to webinar six in the Talking Business During Crisis series. My name is Aviva Berzon. I'm very pleased to be hosting today's conversation on how MBS alumni are helping small businesses to survive. We'll be running this webinar for an hour and finish up by 1.30 today. In a moment, I'll introduce you to today's panelists, but first I'd just like to quickly take you through some housekeeping. So over the course of the next 40 or so minutes, please add any questions you have for today's panelists in the Q&A section. Um, if you like a question you see there, you can thumbs up it, which upvotes it and it goes up to the priority list of questions. We, I will be checking and monitoring the Q&A questions and comments and potentially feed them into the conversation as appropriate, but we will also have 15 to 20 minutes dedicated at the end for Q&A. Um, there will be a survey link which we'll send you at the very end of the webinar just so that we can keep getting your feedback on what sorts of things you'd like to be hearing from us on. Um, so in terms of today's webinar, as I mentioned, it is number six in a series of talking business during crisis. And in this series, we've talked about strategy, leadership and purpose and how those factors come alive and what their relevance is during a crisis. I'm very excited to be introducing you to our panelists today so we can apply these com concepts into um, really the stories of what Lauren and Tom have gone through in their own professional experiences. So to introduce you to our panelists today, we have Lauren Murray, who is the lead customer success strategist at Culture Amp, and Tom Humph Humphreys, who is the co-founder and CEO of BooBooBot. Both Tom and Lauren have been um, MBA students at MBS and worked with a number of other MBS uh, alumni and members of the MBS community to help businesses navigate the challenges of running a small business during a crisis like COVID. And that's what we'll be hearing about today. And moderating the conversation is my colleague, Quang Lim, who is an Associate Professor in Strategic Management at MBS. And my role today will be really to host the conversation and check up on what you're writing in chat and, um, and Q&A so that I can be feeding in the voice of the audience through the conversation. So before we kick off and I hand over to Kwang to moderate the conversation, we're really interested and keen to hear who are you, who is sitting in the audience today. So in a moment, you're going to see a question pop up on your screen and please select the statement that best resonates with your current position and experience. That'll come up in a moment. So what statement best describes your work background? We'll just wait as you fill out those responses. Kwang, I might hand over to you as we're getting, seeing the results being completed. What are you seeing? Who's in the audience? And we can start our conversation. Thank you, Aviva, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm Kwang. Um, as Aviva mentioned, I'm an associate professor at Melbourne Business School, and it is a great delight to have both Lauren and Tom join us today uh, to share what they and some of the other alumni have been doing to help small and medium enterprises. Uh, so Aviva, the, the poll results are in. It looks uh, as though most, most of the audience uh, are from a corporate role, and uh, far distant second, I think, uh, people from small businesses, a few students and um, educational institutions. So it's quite interesting that we are having um, uh, this response. Uh, so um, yeah, no, this is great. Uh, are they seeing the results? I think they are seeing the results. So I'm going to- see the results, yes. Right. So I'm going to go away from the results now and back to the slides. Um, whoops, hang on. I think that worked. Hello everyone. So um, I thought I would begin our conversation by just first setting the stage uh, for the discussion. And I wanted to quickly define and situate small businesses in Australia. So I think we're, this is the topic of today's conversation and it's really important for us to understand just how important it is. Um, so small businesses as defined by our government are those with less than 20 employees, often less than $10 million uh, in revenue. Uh, but they are, they are in total quite significant. They employ about 4.8 million people or about a, a third of all industry added value in a, you know, about 30, 20, 
30% of all employment. Uh, if you include medium-sized enterprises, that shoots up to about two-thirds of the entire economy. Um, so this is quite a significant proportion of Australia that we're talking about. And uh, what's really um, profound is the degree to which COVID-19 disruption uh, has affected small business. So being a small business that, that brings a couple of benefits, right? Many of these small businesses are nimble and resourceful. We've got a lot of scrappy uh, entrepreneurial types that run these small businesses. And that's sort of been the engine uh, of, of growth in, in many parts of, uh, across many sectors of the Australian economy. Uh, but they carry some liabilities as well. So small businesses tend to be constrained in their resources. Often cash flow is a real issue. Um, experience in, on the managerial side often limited, uh, as shown by prior studies. Uh, and you know they're small, so they're competing and working with other big players along the value chain uh, that makes them quite vulnerable. Uh, at a time of a ten pandemic, that's like a tsunami hitting a, a beach, right? It's been terrible for everyone, uh, but small businesses have been especially vulnerable. So I was particularly touched to hear that uh, Tom and Lauren have led uh, in, in this initiative that a group of our alumni have begun uh, in, in sharing some of their skills, expertise, their managerial experience, as well as their time in, in helping some of the small business ar ar around us uh, uh, to deal with the crisis. So I think that's a, a nice place for us to begin that conversation, to think about this backdrop against which all these things are happening. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that we can get this conversation centered around uh, Tom and Lauren. And maybe um, I'd like to have them begin by a quick uh, one minute introduction to themselves. Tell us a little bit more about yourselves, guys. Uh, and then we'll move towards their team and maybe what they've been doing. I'm hoping to have them share a few of the examples of companies that they've worked with and maybe end up with some of the key lessons uh, that we can learn and take away from the experience. Uh, so how about we start with you, Lauren? Tell us a little bit uh, more about yourself. Really? Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for having us on this panel. It's a real honour. So I'm Lauren Murray, Lead Customer Success Strategist at Coltramps. Coltramps are a wonderful HR tech company based out of Melbourne. Um, and my experience really has been in banking. So not in startup world. Uh, I spent 10 years working in large corporates, particularly in the corporate innovation space. Um, and then um, that was at Navin ANZ. I had a wonderful career there and I've kind of been dabbling in the entrepreneurial small business space ever since. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. I might go to Tom. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tom and yeah, I'm the co-founder of Boo Boo Butt. So we're a, a online platform that allows parents to find family rooms and play activities. So the last sort of four years or so, sort of been in that startup space as a co-founder and as a consultant, um, and also a bit of a stint at Telstra Health there. Uh, did an MBA full time. Prior to that, I was seven years in government in various roles. That's it in a nutshell, I guess, Quan. Thanks, thanks both of you. Um, and I understand that you've both played a pivotal role in bringing together a team of people to help small businesses during the pandemic. Could you tell us a little about the genesis? How did it all begin? Like, what did you do? How, you know, how did it all take off? Awesome, that's my story to tell, I think, Top. I'm sorry with this one. Really, um, a little bit of context here is that, you know, Coltramp are very fast to respond to COVID and based on my prior experiences, particularly working in banking, but also just in the, the small business space, we re really recognised quite quickly that small businesses were going to be extremely vulnerable to some of the decisions that were being made. And if you think back to what I call BC times, but before COVID and before we had the lockdowns, uh, information was really unclear. Every day we'd wake up and there'd be a different part of the news, there'd be different things happening in different states. Uh, there was a real kind of absence of leadership in communicating exactly how small businesses can or couldn't operate. I think at one point you couldn't go to a funeral unless there was someone cutting your hair. Uh, and it was really quite hard for people to make sense of all of it. Um, it really was born out of an idea. I'm quite action orientated. And with this scene, this sort of play out, we kind of had a few decisions to make. So as a family, it was like, are we going to support the local small businesses in our area? Or is there something we could apply our skills and talents to, um, to try and make a bit of an impact? And it was kind of, um, after mulling about it and talking to Tom for a couple of days, we kind of decided that, yes, this was something we could easily offer and facilitate. Um, and the idea kind of went from there like a rocket ship. That's amazing. Uh, Tom, so why, why did you say yes to this? Uh, other than shit you your arm. <laughs> 
Um, well, really, like we both like helping the community around us, whether that is our immediate community and the small businesses around us, so it's at a cafe, for example, but also like the MDS community as a whole, right? Like there's, as we see from that poll, there's a broad ranging community of alumni who are facing various different challenges. And we had the capacity, well, we do have the capacity to keep helping people. Right. So we thought, well, we'd put the offer out there and see see what happened. And as Lauren said, it sort of took off a bit like a rocket ship. Right. And at, at this early stage, when you were beginning, was the idea the same as how it ended up? Uh, what was what was the core of what you were trying to do at that time? No, so it's, it's, it's such an interesting journey. And I think this is like full credit to the team when we, we talked to how that kind of evolved. But the original idea that I had that Tom had to agree to um, was that we would do 30 minutes of free consulting um, and that would just be thinking it's nice and easy let's keep the barriers to entry really low let's just keep it organic and we'll put it out there and we'll see if anyone takes us up on it um, it was something we we're kind of mulling on like what would be a meaningful for, sort of service during this time uh, there's lots of wonderful organizations government groups people who do this professionally for a living. Um, mm. It was really about what can we do immediately to have an immediate impact on the things we could see around us. And originally when we put the offer out there, we thought we'd be talking to cafes and gyms and people who you could immediately think would be dramatically impacted by a lockdown or you know immediate loss of cash flow. As um, it, it kind of grew from there, it's like, my shout out to the September 2015 cohort, which is clearly the best cohort because I, I took the idea to them. Um, I woke up on the Monday morning. I was like, that's it. We've been talking about it for a week. We're going to go. And we put the, put the offer out there and Ming jumped on it straight away. And by then I had a very small team of behind us and the confidence that we actually could do something at a little bit more scale than just Tom and I um, working as a family on this sort of piece. And so from there, it just went gangbusters. Um, and we've had a tremendous response and tremendous enthusiasm from the MBS community, particularly um, about joining in the initiative, but also from small businesses who we've been, had the pleasure of really working with and kind of unpacking some of their challenges during this time. Right. Um, so I understand this team began to coalesce very rapidly around the idea and around the two of you who were sort of the nucleus of this, you know, like you were leading a team and it was starting to form. But could you tell me a little more about this team? Uh, who were they? What did they do? Um, how did they come together? Yeah. Uh, what's up? No, sorry. <laughs> how the team formed. So I took it to my cohort. We have a wonderful cohort alumni channel. Uh, we like each other. We've worked together for many years. Uh, it's part of the perks of being a part-time student is to go on journeys with people the whole way through. Am I frozen? Oh, um, I hope Ooh, not. Hold on. No? Okay, you're all frozen on my one. That's okay, I'll keep telling the story. Whoops, um, do, so, do you see the team slide I, that you had sent me on your screen? No, not yet. That's okay. Oh dear. Um, we can hear you, Lauren, though. So okay. you can, if you can hear yeah. me, I'll keep, I'll keep the story going. Of course, let me try it again. Issues. Welcome to COVID life. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this again. Uh, so, they had earlier sent me a slide, so I, I thought I would share that. Hopefully this comes out. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, but now Lauren okay. disappeared <laughs> from my screen. Tom, did you want to still hear me? We're yes. waiting we, for Lauren. So we can hear Lauren. So maybe Lauren, tell us okay. about the team and then Tom, hop in uh, as and when. Terrible technical stuff. Um, so Yes, so I put the, the offer out to September 2015 cohort. We had an initial team and the posts went up by lunchtime the same day. So we worked on it in the background um, and quickly established some sort of rough outline where we put the post up and see if anyone wanted to join the team um, or any small businesses wanted to work with us. And we had just a tremendous outreach from people in the initial network because the first post went up on LinkedIn, um, but also across a lot of our organic socials. So we joined entrepreneur groups on Facebook. Uh, we went and joined Instagram sort of communities and, and really made sure we were spreading the word as far and wide as we possibly could, that if anyone needed a hand, um, we would be more than happy to have an initial session with them to unpack some of these challenges. Uh, in the same respects, Tom took it to his cohort, so to his full-time cohort, and managed to um, bring some really talented people along uh, that you can see on the slide um, into the initial team. And from there, we went really simple, keeping it really lean, 
uh, we set up the WhatsApp community. We had a shared Google Drive. Um, and from there, things were kind of rolling. So uh, something that was really great was Anthony Miller joined the team and picked up initially that our processes weren't going to scale. Um, so he went about looking at ways to improve our operations. And likewise, with Darika um, running a really fantastic initiative to try and shape up some better questions um, and some process innovation, we could ask the small business to make sure we were a bit better equipped as they came through. Um, but it really went from having just an initial post and me sharing the small businesses and asking if anyone in the team could pick it up um, to having quite a robust sort of way of working, sharing insights, coming back, sharing stories, sharing knowledge, doing case studies um, and really working quite well as a group. It was fantastic. Right. Well, I'm seeing some familiar faces. I, I think these are some of my ex-students too. And uh, it's great that they all came together and uh, the fact that you reached out and they, they, they came aboard, I think it speaks well to you know, the camaraderie among our alumni. But why do you think they said yes? Like, did, did you ask them why they came aboard? Maybe um, either of you might have some insight on that. Yeah, it might be a good one for Tom to, to perhaps have a stab at. Yeah, certainly. Like, I think a lot of the, the people that did come along for the journey were either, uh, a lot of them, particularly the, the full-time ones, were in, in small business as well. So they were sort of feeling the immediate impact and obviously had that really deep and close connection to it. Then a lot of the, the part-times that came along, I think what it really does is speaks testament to, to MBS's sort of community in that a lot are very purpose-driven and they do want to help their communities around them. They want to be able to support and lend where they can. So like people in the group, um, as we sort of said, they range from every different sort of like profession, vertical and industry. But they all had that, that common drive of wanting to assist and help out where they can because as, as Lauren went over before, like in those early days, it was, it was chaotic. You had some businesses that were shutting, but a person across the street was still open, they were the exact same business, there's a lot of confusion. And I think a lot of people wanted to be able to help out where they could in that, in that situation really stood up and took that leadership role within their community. I think that's what a lot of the MBS community wanted to do in this situation. That's really inspiring to hear. Um, and Aviva, I think it does resonate with some of the rest of the stories we've seen in the series where, you know, you have a leadership element, but you also have the purpose that brings people together and how they they moved by um, not not just the, the leaders, but also they want to be part of something uh, that's really meaningful and making a difference. Um, so yeah, no, hats off to um, all of our ex-students and everyone else. I think they're not just alumni, but everyone else who ha has clambered aboard uh, this team. Um, so thank you both for leading it and thanks to all of the alumni for sharing the purpose and joining the team. Um, I think there are a couple of questions starting to pop in. Do you want to take that yet, uh, Aviva, or shall we continue a bit more? Um, why don't we continue a bit more and, and then I'll feed some of the questions through. Excellent. Uh, so I'd like to turn briefly to the question of, well, now that you had a team, what did you actually work on together? How did the team develop? What activities do you engage in? Um, what, what steps did you take to help the small businesses? Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think you still probably can't see me, but if you can keep hearing me, I will continue to talk. Um, so one of the things that we picked up really quickly was that a lot of these challenges that were coming in were a little bit more far reaching and difficult to resolve than we initially suspected. I think I said at the start, like we thought they'd be gyms, we thought they'd be cafes, and there were some really good lessons learned from overseas how these businesses were able to respond, pivot, and kind of innovate to continue to grow through this period. So I think it's important to understand that like with COVID, the disruption presents opportunities both ways, um, particularly that some businesses and some of the businesses reached out to us had growth challenges, as opposed to having a real decline in revenue and needing to kind of think very hard about what their business model will be in the new world. Um, so identifying that some of the things coming through were quite big, meaty sort of really difficult positions and we can't imagine how a small business would feel trying to solve that by themselves. We, we quickly paired up. So the team worked in pairs. Um, we quickly also went about understanding who, what sort of skills and talents did we have across the group? 
um, and did almost like a bit of a self-assessment looking at where are you strong at, what, what sort of inquiries are you best equipped to deal with? And that helped triage some of the inquiries coming through because we had some really far reaching ones from being like straight up cash flow sort of dilemmas to being like questions about a leadership challenge. Like how do people step up as leaders during this time? How do people step up and manage a redundancy process with empathy and with care? Um, and so it was a really quite broad sort of skill melting pot. I mean, you can just look at our team. We had a mix of wonderful engineers. You had people working in tech, you had people in banking. We had people like really, you know, quite a really broad range of skills and talents. Um, and particularly like some of these problems are more well suited to a marketer than someone who can look at the processes. So it was one of the things we, we did really fast was to pivot the way we were serving the small businesses to make sure that they were getting the best person on the team um, to take on their inquiry. Um, that's fantastic. And you had this slide that you shared with us. So it sounds like there was a very rapid, uh, there was like a two week process of onboarding uh, a large number of people onto the team uh, and you've made quite an impact including i think a a write-up with some lessons uh, to learn uh, but what seemed surprising was the breadth of uh, breadth of the kinds of companies on the right of your slide that needed help or were seeking to engage with this process am, am i right in reading what you had sent uh, maybe tom Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, that, that's probably a really good way of looking at it. Like, as we sort of started out, like, we were thinking it might be the immediate people around us. But then it came very apparent that the disruption that COVID brought, brought not just the, the top of mind loss of revenue, loss of business, loss of total demand, it really did create opportunities for a lot of businesses that were in positions of enablement. So we can see that the VR company that did experience rapid growth in that particular time, if that was a particular business that did find itself in a lot of demand. And so I guess the best example would be, say, Zoom, right? Zoom was out and then it just went bang overnight, right? But what also became apparent was the businesses impacted were very, very diverse. So say the immigration law firm, Right, which I think Lauren will talk about a bit more in a bit, uh, a bit more detail is that like once you shut your borders, like where does their workflow go? How can they help people? How can they stay in business? How can they pivot? Like all these questions and say corporate catering. Once all corporate stop leaving their office, stop holding functions, there's all these sort of flow on effects and it will, it's sort of the top of mind when all the corporates had everyone home and sort of changed the entire way the economy sort of worked. I think that was the disruption that we really did see percolating through the small business community as well. Right. Did you want to add anything on? Um, no, I think that's pretty succinct. I would say for me personally, a, a big lesson was like the COVID disruption is much more far reaching than you can kind of walk on the street and see. So you can see these small businesses that have to close up shop um, and hopefully pivot to online. But when the, the immigration law firm reached out, it was a real kind of penny drop moment for me where I was like, these are really serious challenges to our economy and how small businesses are gonna be able to thrive during this time. Um, just understanding the way that a business like that kind of is organized in the way that they have work and then with borders being shut, visas not being processed and then just you know, like the talented people in there it really was Kind of one of the big ones where it's been like wow this is uh far greater than us um or you know like far greater than the work that our team is doing um which you know it's been great to see like the government sort of step in with some of these programs that really that was the saving grace for that sort of firm um to get through this period as well right well i'm, I'm eager for us to get into maybe a couple of examples or stories where we can really uh, dig in and, and um, hear about some of these cases. But maybe just before we do that, um, how about we do a quick poll uh, to find out if uh, the audience has engaged with uh, small businesses in, in some way or the other. So Aviva, I think you have a poll set up that maybe we could share. There you are. So you should see it on screen. Um, please choose one and we'd love to see what 
um, degree to which you have worked with or worked at or uh, engaged with small businesses. Um, and we've seen quite a number who are consulting to or offering services to small businesses. Um, interestingly, we, we do have maybe 10 business, small business owners or 11 business owners. Um, oh, it's climbing. So it's now, it seems like it's equal between people who are servicing small businesses as well as small business owners. Uh, so yeah, so uh, Aviva is collecting the questions that you're posting and e even if you don't get to them, we will answer them on the website, uh, but also feel free to reach out to Lauren and Tom and the rest of the alumni um, after this. Um, so thank you for answering the poll. Um, how about we spend a few minutes on a couple of examples and then go to questions. Um, is that okay, Aviva? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Just collecting questions. Yeah, excellent. So um, you had a, a few stories, Tom and Lauren, um, that maybe you might be willing to share. Could you, could you tell us a little more about some of these engagements and maybe some of the lessons that you learned from trying to help these small businesses, uh, you and your team? Yeah, totally. Um, Tom, did you want me to start? Uh, if, if you want to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think that the, we've got a wonderful video prepared that'll be great to share with everyone online shortly, um, which is from Colin, who runs a fantastic firm doing some awesome stuff in the VR sort of space. And he had a growth related challenge. But one that personally hit home for me really was a coffee roaster. Um, that reached out. So this was a cross Tasman, they're a New, New Zealand and Australian based sort of business, um, quite a big brand. They roast coffee uh, and you know, if you unpack those sorts of challenges, we're talking about supply chain disruption, you're talking about cash flow disruption because uh, dining coffee is kind of taken away. Um, they've got warehouses full of people that are working like bagging coffee, roasting coffee, like doing some really great operational sort of pieces. And there was this wonderful leader that reached out just asking to have a chat about how to kind of step up as a leader during this point. Like she, she kind of just taken on this really big role as the head of the Australian operation and was just kind of in this really weird position where you can imagine being, you know, being so excited, being promoted, running a really fantastic brand and then having like the carpet pulled out from underneath you on multiple fronts and just kind of not knowing where to start as a leader. Like, what do you address first? Like, you've got your team that need reassurance that they're going to get paid, that they have salaries, but you're trying to manage supply chains, you're trying to manage the business, you're trying to do all these sorts of things, and your parent company is actually based in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of like, it was a really, really challenging sort of personal position to be in as well. But the, the resounding sort of conversations we had again and again with every small business, and I know the team had again and again with every small business, was just how critical looking after your people is during a time like this. Um, and like just making sure that you're hearing them and that you, you, they can visibly see you doing stuff and like how important it is to over communicate. And like all of these challenges, like, you know, it's not very MBA of me to say, but like cash comes second. Um, you can always show up your cash line. We can always help you pivot and find new business models. There's always opportunities in all of these situations. But it isn't your people that will get you through these sorts of periods of time. It's the extra sort of discretionary effort that they'll bring in, um, the innovation that they'll bring to the table, like their willingness to go above and beyond shouldn't really be underestimated. And that's so important for particularly a small business where you've got such small intimate teams where for some people like a place of work is their home and shutting down an office or shutting down a shop takes away that sense of home and that security. And so you, you as a leader, you're, you're trying to manage all of this and it is quite a big sort of challenge and there's lots of wonderful resources out there um, to kind of face into that particular one. But I think with that particular conversation, just reassuring that like, the fact that she was even thinking about how her people were feeling during this right time is showing leadership through the crisis, like demonstrating that vulnerability, demonstrating that you, you, you know, the empathy for the, how your teams are coping and kind of feeling through this period. Like that is leadership at its crux. We don't always right. have the answers as leaders. That is fantastic because it's easy to just, you know, especially as we're MBAs, it's easy to think about, well, it's ROI, it's sort of, <laughs> let's worry yes. about the numbers and let's worry about, um, you know, the, the sort of the hard side. 
Um, but what you're saying is the people really matter and you've got to put that first. That's really, I think, an important insight. Um, were there ways in which you found effective to bring that to the companies? Like, was this part of the 30-minute coaching or did you have to send them to other resources? Like, How, how did you mm -hmm. enable these people uh, at the so small businesses? It really, really great question. It was very different for each of the small businesses. So I'd say first off, like 30 minutes is a great lead generator for free services. Um, but a lot of our conversations went for a little bit longer. And I know some of the teams are still kind of working with some of these small businesses, running check-ins and kind of seeing how they're going because we, we all deeply care and are invested in it, which is really harks back to the, the purpose of why everyone joined on and um, we got on board giving up some time and capacity to help people out. But a lot of it was referring them to other resources. Uh, you cannot underestimate at that time, particularly when we were in very, very high demand, we had lots of small businesses reaching out. There was a real absence of just like clear pathways for people to go and get the best sort of guidance um, and just really objective sort of useful information. And I think to the team's credit, we played a really great valuable role in just looking at things with a very objective lens um, and making sure they were getting the appropriate support that they needed. A, a really great example also would be the work that um, Tim and the team did with a, a small business consultant who was a team of one um, running innovation programs and doing all these sorts of wonderful things in BC times. Uh, mm. But obviously that was all sort of disrupted and just rethinking about how he was able to get business um, was a big challenge for, for this operator. And, you know, using frameworks like a lean business model canvas and actually sitting down and putting everything back on a page um, and just going back to basics to reimagine what your business will look like post COVID was just as a valuable activity as having someone to just listen and to give you feedback or confidence that the decisions you were making were the right ones for your business as well. Fantastic. Lauren, I might jump in there. I think you've gone some way to answering this question, but the most upvoted question at the moment comes from Letitia and um, asked exactly to, to understand what, how those 30 minute sessions evolved, what did they evolve to and the types of small businesses that picked them up? Yep, yeah, great question. So I think um, originally they were just 30, 30 minutes, we'd book in a Zoom or a phone call um, and kind of hope for the best and we went very quickly that a little bit more structured, never hurt anyone. Um, and so we, we set about asking a series of upfront questions, which is available in our Google form now, um, which helps arm the team better. So with a better understanding of the challenges and the kind of opportunities in your space and a little bit of context about your business and how you usually sort of operate, the, the team were able to go away in the pairs um, and really look for the right frameworks to bring into those sessions none of them were exactly the same. So I, I mean, we're, we're a bunch of volunteers. Um, we also have kind of the same training because we ordered an MBA, um, but all of the sessions were really customized to meet the business where they were on their journey. And that was a big ethos that we ran through everything that we did in the, the work that we were doing was that we were meeting them where they were. And so there's lots and lots of different frameworks you can draw on from everywhere. Um, and a lot of it's open source and free. Um, but the team would do that upfront sort of investment and kind of prep work to make sure that we we're coming in and delivering value um, and making sure that we we're leaving with a list of actionable things or decisions for that business to make. Um, and one great thing is I'll do a shout out to Dave was that he picked up really quickly that we probably needed some sort of indemnity clause um, in just in case. So we went about and actually engaged uh, a lawyer to pull that together for us and had all the small businesses complete it before we would um, enter into any of these sorts of talks as well, just to make sure all the volunteers were protected. Aviva, do you, do you want to continue or shall we head back to um, maybe another example? Um, I was wondering if Tom had anything um, to add to that question. I think Lauren covered a lot of it and I think it's probably only adding a little bit on, but what we sort of did was allow the business to nominate an area that they wanted to speak about specifically if they wanted to. So the conversation might be broad ranging, but what we'd find is the teams would sort of narrow in into what was the sort of, I guess, the crux issue that they wanted to speak about. And as from the examples Lauren's given previously, like there was ones about how does a leader lead their people through this? There was a growth issue. 
you've got people with supply issues and it really was testament to the group that came together that we actually had the professional skill sets to be able to deal with that but also what the MBA gave everyone was the ability to manage and look at everything objectively with the right frameworks and concepts and once you put those two together it delivered real value for these businesses. Quang, I might ask one more question and then hand back over to you. Sure. Seems quite timely and it's from Nick. Nick's asked and it's been upvoted by five people. Um, in working with um, SMB businesses, beyond looking at what, need, what needs to be done simply to survive the crisis, were there any growth opportunities uncovered which may never have been realised if COVID-19 had not struck? Yeah. Certainly. Um, really great question, Nick. So I think with a lot of the teams, uh, particularly like <laughs> small businesses get started because someone is passionate about a problem most of the time um, and they kind of hop into it without kind of doing the frameworks and having a business plan and just taking the time to actually put everything out and like the lean business model canvas got a bit of a workout with some of them. But it, it did uncover growth opportunities, like what the new world will look like and how you can respond. Like I would comfortably say like some of the teams were able to identify like completely new ways of working um, I've got feedback from some of the small businesses that they worked with that it helped them identify existing inefficiencies in their operations processes and you know that they were able to carry forward not only to get through COVID but really to thrive um, and to be stronger as a small business from having that sort of once-off chat with the team um, which is again just a real credit to everyone who came together and the, the skills and the care that was shown in prepping and making sure what we were delivering was really high value and high impact. Thank you. Um, just to mention, you you got a shout out from Mona in New Zealand. Coffee and Susie are sending her greetings or his greetings. Oh. <laughs> yes. And I'll just quickly mention to Nick who had that question that um, in another episode of this series, I think, I believe it was Jeff Martin who was speaking about the different stages uh, between, you know, so like moving from surviving to rebuilding to thriving and having a different business plans to fit that short, very short run versus the longer run. Um, so I, I refer you to that as I think a good resource um, and happy, I think, for us to continue this conversation. Uh, but that question reminded me of, um, I think, the video that you had sent mm. about a growth opportunity that had emerged. So uh, if people don't mind, I might share that video now. Um, and uh, hopefully this works. Let's see. Can you guys see a video? Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Colin from Silver Adventures. My company focuses on group virtual reality sessions for aged care residents. We, uh, we provide a solution that really helps reduce isolation and reduce loneliness by bringing the world to residents through virtual reality. We can't see our hands. <laughs> that was taking a bit of a break. I spotted Lauren's post on LinkedIn a few months ago when the, the COVID crisis started and uh, I thought it was a great initiative and as a business we were in a, a bit of a unique position where the, the increased isolation was a huge opportunity for us. I got in touch with Lauren and uh, I, I messaged her about how our business was not so much contracting and not dealing with some of the stresses like other businesses but actually in a period of growth and uh, to see if there were any people in her network that could offer us some advice, some expertise and, and a fresh set of eyes and she was really helpful. So thanks Lauren, uh, you put me in touch with Michael who was, who was great. He gave us some great feedback, he got some great ideas about next steps and, and just ultimately helping our company and, and doing all of that completely for free. It was, uh, it was really helpful to the business and, um, and we've initiated some of the, the ideas that, that he put forward and some of the suggestions and, uh, and it was great. So I just wanted to say thanks and, uh, and all the best and keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Well, hope, hopefully that video uh, streamed okay across the universe. Uh, but um, yeah, tell us more about um, that, like in, in terms of like key lessons or key insights that uh, your team had 
uh, derived from that. Yeah, particularly with um, Colin. So Colin's business, as you could see in that video, it's pretty cool. Um, and obviously isolation represented just like a whole new world of opportunities for them to consider. But um, so Mike, Michael ran the lead on this one and they just had such a fantastic conversation. Um, and, you know, as you heard from Colin specifically, just like in terms of rethinking kind of how they are currently doing things and where the extra opportunities lie. Um, it was a great example of COVID representing like huge growth opportunities, um, particularly in isolation. And it's just made such a tremendous impact. And I highly encourage everyone to follow Colin on um, LinkedIn if you'd like as well, because he posts lots of wonderful videos of people using their technology to kind of bridge the social isolation challenges that uh, COVID's really introduced. Tom, were you about to say something? Oh, no. Uh, okay. Just nodding away. Right. Well, oh, I might turn to you because I, I suppose you, you're an entrepreneur and you do run a small business. So love to hear uh, maybe about you and your own experience sort of on the other side of this. Like you, you know, on the one hand, you're yeah. part of the team that's helping others. But on the other hand, you're also a small business owner. How's it been? Uh, interesting. Uh, stressful and a bit frustrating. But I guess to... Um, I can probably give you a bit of a, a live case study on sort of the decision making process we had to go through. So our business is one that allows parents to easily find family rooms and play activities. And so from a business perspective, it's essentially a platform. You've got the users, the parents. You've also got the businesses who operate this. So if you look at the driving behavior of that is that is people leaving the house. So we were pushing along with the, the tech development and the go live date of mid April. So around Easter time, so about the 13th of April, which as everyone will know, smack bang during lockdown. So we sort of had to think about what, what do we do? And so obviously do the MBA thing and make sure that we've got enough cash flow and enough runway to sort of hold on for a period of time or a month. So once we sort of worked out that so I made sure that there was a runway. We then looked at the optionality that we had. So we discussed with our developer potentially around slowing down our development date. And we used a, a great firm from another MBS alum, so Bodhi Tech, we shout out to Sid. And what we found was that they were they were happy to do that and we managed to work out a, a good arrangement. So rather than enter, entering UAT, we built out a few more functions and a bit more functionality for the MVP. But that, that was all well and good. And then we obviously then had to juggle the corona shutdown here, but our developers were offshore. So we had to develop, juggle two shutdowns, two lockdowns, which impacted both the tech build and then our ability to go to market here. And once things started opening up again, it was very good. We could start going about the BD work with the businesses and also starting to introduce the product amongst close friends and family for market testing and, and UAT essentially. Then this latest shutdown sort of come along. So it sort of put those those plans on hold again. But as, as, a, as a small business owner, like there's a sense of like a frustration, not just in anything or anything in particular, but it's something beyond your control. And that's just something you've got to live with. You've got to manage that. You can't let it overtake you. You've got to make sure you make objective decisions but it's a lot harder when your own capital and your own sort of livelihoods on the line like a bit more so the clouding your judgment and i think that's certainly something that the group was able to help other businesses with is obviously provide that objectivity and that that mba level of optionality so we tried applying that as much as possible to to boo boo but so websites up currently so many parents out there just want to have a quick squeeze feel free to go on and have a look and all feedback's welcome. More time for customer testing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, so we'll, we'll post we'll post a link to the website and all the other resources we mentioned uh, on the MBS website, along with a video of this event afterwards. Um, Aviva, I'm mindful that we are getting some really good questions. Yeah. From, we should turn to that, right? Because um, yeah. yeah. 
Yep, and just to acknowledge a few comments. So John Lee has said the story, so I presume the story of how the MBS alumni came together to support small businesses. This story would make a good case study, could then be used with the wider MBS cohort that are seeking to participate in continuous management education. And that got a bit of traction. So there you go. Great the idea. Feedback. Great idea. <laughs> Um, a question that's been quite popular by Intias is, to my understanding, most businesses have cash flow issues for them to continue. What are your few key advices that you have given them to enable continuity, especially businesses that are essentially dying as a result of COVID? Mm, I'll throw that to Lauren. I will. Um, cash, my least favourite topic. No, sorry. <laughs> Cash is everything. Cash is king if you're a small business and it's so important. And when I think back to the first couple of small businesses we had kind of coming through on the offer, this was before there was any sort of government support. So this was pre JobKeeper, it was pre being able to negotiate commercial leases. Um, it was kind of pre all of these formal programs. What these programs have done is really extended the lifeline on probably a lot of tough decisions that we do still need to make in whatever this new post-COVID world is or if there is even a post-COVID world. Um, there's a couple of things that I have shared and I shared in the, the post but the first is that often cutting your marketing is actually the wrong decision um, and there's some really great research behind this and I know it's not intuitive and I know everyone's like that it's marketing. Um, brands that cut from their marketing budget actually suffer more in the long term um, and there's some really great studies that I'll, I'll link in this as well so it's, this is actually probably the time to kind of double down on your branding perspective and then understand that that doesn't necessarily make sense when you're talking about cash flow um, the other thing to consider with cash flow that's entirely non-intuitive and this is something that we learn as MBA students through managing corporate turnarounds or I did at least when I was a I did it at London Business School, is that you really should consider um, carving out the asset that's probably performing the best. And it, sometimes you have to sell kind of that crown jewel to, to save the kingdom. And again, that's not a very kind of attractive offer. Um, but when we're talking about cash flow, that could be the difference between you making payroll and surviving a year um, or having you know, government support wound back in September and needing to rethink about these options again. And then, um, I mean, I understand that both of these, everyone's probably got frowny faces and they can't see anything. Is there some really immediate options available to you as well is to look at your receivables, make sure you're getting your account receivables in fast so turn them into cash as quickly as possible. Um, really double down on the performance metrics that you have. A lot of small businesses don't have really great robust financial metrics to think about how you spend your money, what the targets are for spending money. And this kind of ties into your marketing as well as like, use what existing cash you have very smartly and then the, the really big third piece that i really encourage and if we're big fans of books um i highly recommend call petition is to think very strategically about what you are competing on and what you are not and what is driving costs so a great example of this in play was hospitality businesses that realized very quickly paying uber eats like 25, 30% of each of their meals was draining their cash flow and their ability to survive. So they joined in a partnership with other businesses like them to organize delivery services. Recognizing that they don't compete directly on how the food gets to someone um, is a great way of saving cash. You'll have competitors as a small business where you aren't gonna be competing on direct things. It could be inputs, could be delivery, could be postage fees. All of these things add up really dramatically and get quite out of hand um, for a small business. So have a think about, particularly in this time when cash is really important, what can you partner with, or as we call it, co-op, <laughs> co-op petition, um, kind of agree to work together on to solve. And that's a really great innovation that has a really big impact on your bottom line um, and will free up some of your cash flow as well. Anyway, Tom, you're the accountant. Did you want to add anything extra? Well, that was a very good answer. Uh, the only thing that, that I could add to that would be just slow down your, your accounts payable. And that's it. Just try and turn that any sort of that one or two percent that may stay in your bank account a bit longer, maybe out of help your cash flow over the longer run. But, but Lauren, your answer was great. Thank you. Very clear, practical advice there. Not necessarily the easy things to do, but some really good direction there. Um, I'll just refer you to, we've probably got time for another couple of questions and there's one from our own Ian Harper who's asked, 
Are any of the small businesses you're advising reporting an inability to access finance as a constraint on their survival? Ooh, really With, great question. Yeah. Um, I can't say that we have had that. We did have a wonderful team member, Andrew Wilson, who was an old colleague of mine and a sneaky AGSM who made it into the team. Um, he actually specialises in business plans and small business finance. Like I'm coming from ex banking, and you know, like cash, you can borrow in this environment. Like it is available. Um, I know from my experiences before. Anyway, like we're very big at supporting, particularly NAB small businesses and they're as invested in your business as you are. Um, I would say if you're having difficulty accessing or drawing down on your finance, start the conversations. The worst thing a small business can do um, is to not ask for help. As soon as the banks, businesses, like your landlord, your family, everyone knows that you need financial assistance, um, things will happen. Uh, and I'm saying that particularly because of my very first jobs at ANZ, which is a well unknown secret, was in collections and impaired asset management. And I was restructuring business debts um, and finances during the height of the GFC. And the businesses that we were able to help were the businesses that raised the flag early. And um, so always start these conversations much, much earlier um, and always be really transparent on what your position looks like because the help is available. And there's lots of small business lenders looking at really great ways to get you through this period. Um, you just need to start and just kind of start that conversation. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic insight, Aviva, um, because finance is not just about the money, it's about the relationships. And especially in an environment where collateral is shaky in, in terms of, you know, you, you might not have the kind of collateral that will secure your debt that relationship then becomes a counterpoint that helps reassure whoever is offering you finance that you're doing the right thing with their, uh, with their cash <laughs> right? and that they'll get their money back. Exactly. Yeah. Thomas, did you have any thoughts on that one? You seem to be involved with the accounting as Lauren was saying. <laughs> well, yeah, like the, the, the perspective that Lauren had it in, in the banking teams that did that, like, it's the perfect way for a business to look at it and they should take that advice like the early bird gets the worm like it's as simple as that you can look at not just in the banking sort of finance sector you can look at larger corporates and stuff it's the ones that say they need assistance early are the ones that, that get it right they look at quantas as opposed to virgin obviously very generalized but going early is an advantage in this situation Thanks for that, Tom. Kwang, maybe I'll go through one or two more questions and then we'll work to yeah. up. Yep. Um, just acknowledging Jan Marshall's comment, which I think ties into what we're talking about right now. Um, she said, it's so important to hear how many people have been affected, the de dependencies and the roll on effects. So these sorts of sharing of these stories, hearing about what's going on, I think is probably helping people understand probably where they are relative to others, but also how they can support. Mm. Thanks for that comment. Lauren, did you, sorry, it sounded like you were going to say something. No, I was just agreeing. I think um, to, to Jan's point and having done this work, like we have a much deeper understanding um, to Kwan's early opening, how critical small businesses are in our economy, particularly in Australia. And it's a lot deeper than the ones we can just immediately see. So I'm glad I'm um, sharing these stories is helping kind of bring some airtime and visibility to some of the challenges for people out there right now. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. There's a question from Siva saying, assuming SMB businesses that are not able to survive can make a strategic decision to temporarily shut down to save cash or they have shut down of no choice, what should their recovery plan be or what would they, should they be doing to get ready for a recovery? It's a big question there. That is, that is a big question. Um, there's, there's quite a lot to unpack, but I... If your business, uh, my, my advice would be is if, you, if you're looking at a hiatus, is look at how do you go to market afterwards and have a, a few different sort of tactical ways of going about it. Because as we've talked about, our, our small business has, has a purpose and that purpose is their core competency and their core ability. What may change is how they serve their market would be what does it look like in another, say, phased out. Um, lockdown reduction or if it's just a hard reopen. So a few different plans for that and how to look about that. But 
to Lauren's point previously, what you need to be able to do is keep your customers engaged and your marketing there coming along with you because otherwise the customers will go somewhere else if they still need your product. So you've got to bring them along with you as well. It's the same constant communication with them. Thanks, Tom. Was there anything you wanted to add to that, Lauren? Um, I'm just going to play devil's advocate on this one as an innovator, but what, what is recovery? What does recovery mean? And how long can you put a business on hiatus? So if you're talking about your current existing operating model and that's something you can put on hold, there's always more opportunities to be explored um, through connecting with customers and looking for products and services. Again, like the hospitality industry of just take this so resilient. Um, even in the way that people who are, you know, brewing gin and turn to make sanitizer. There's lots and lots of different opportunities available in this sort of space. So I'd be really clear on what a hiatus actually means um, for your business strategy in the long run. Thanks. Can I just quickly add, um, I think as a strategy person, I would encourage you to think about what's changed on demand, on the demand side of the equation, what's changed on the supply side of the equation. If your customers are going to be fundamentally changed after COVID, then your go-to-market must take a different path. Mm. On the supply side, the biggest concerns are supply chain disruption. Uh, but also, if you go on hiatus, you lose potentially the, the talent, the people that work for you. Uh, let's say you run a very fancy restaurant, uh, very specialized chefs. Once they dissipate, rebuilding a team that can deliver the same thing is not a trivial activity. Uh, getting them work together, work well together, may take um, a lot of investment. So in that case, you might want to do something different instead of trying to revive exactly the same thing. Uh, I, I am mindful of the time, Aviva, so maybe um, let me ask a question to sort of bring it all together first for the two of them, and then I'll pass it to you. But um, let me end with this question for you. What, what have you, um, what have you learned from this experience um, in terms of the most useful things you have been able to bring to bear from either your, your previous work experience or from your MBA? Like if there were key lessons that you wanted others to share in terms of tools or frameworks or concepts that have become most valuable in, in doing this very important activity, what, what would they be? So big picture. I'll take a start. Um, I think big picture wise for both, if you're interested in kind of running a crazy volunteer action orientated consulting scene group in a, a time of need. Um, it, likewise, if you're a small business trying to make it through a period of disruption, which is good, could be good or bad for you. It, it's always about people um, and having a really clear sort of messaging, like taking it back to a framework sort of piece is to think about how to create a movement and that really terrible video of that man dancing on the hill that was able to get that first move up. That's a little bit what it felt like when Ming said, yes, I'll join your team um, when I started this sort of piece. And likewise for small businesses, like some useful frameworks to think about is how are you connecting and listening to your employees during this period? Um, how are you making sure that you're over communicating and being clear and involving in this piece? There's lots and lots of wonderful resources about how to get the most out of people then you collaborate and you give them the space to be a high performing sort of team um, and I really encourage you to have a, a look because the businesses that come out of this stronger are the ones that will have really tapped into the experience and specializations um, of the people that they work alongside with every day um, so I think that that's a, a key lesson that plays into to the both sort of respects um, and of course, again, the Lean Business Model Canvas. If you can't get your idea on one page, um, you don't know what your idea is well enough. <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> Tom, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, just, just quickly would be, is like directly for the people in those situations, is just try and focus on the things you can control in that the things immediately in front of you, that'll help manage your stress levels. And so make sure that you're more balanced as a leader going forward in those situations. Fantastic, thank you, Tom. And Kwang, did you have any final words to sort of bring what you've heard together? Um, I, I just think overall that the most important thing it seemed to me is the, the you need the leadership 
and you need something that brings people together, especially in this time when everyone is distracted and everyone is stressed and they're worried about you know everything from their own safety to their kids going to school, that if it's not compelling, um, people won't come together. So you, you need that purpose, uh, but you also need uh, people to drive that process. I don't think this would have happened if Lauren and Tom had not stepped up, but uh, you know, I also think that um, the fact that our alumni went out in pairs and tried to basically um, fan out across the, the terrain to you know, sort of like divide and conquer to help, uh, I think that's really uh, given each of them a, a chance to lead a pro, sort of a micro process within the sort of umbrella activity. So having sort of an organizing framework to think about leadership and purpose, I think it's a must. Otherwise, all you have is just fragmented activity. Um, but what it sounds like has happened here is that uh, the people that have come together have come together in a very coherent way. And that for me, it's a really important message for others who want to do something like that. Fantastic. Thank you, Kwang. And thank you, Kwang, for moderating a great conversation. A big, big thank you to Lauren and Tom for sharing your story and for rallying together the efforts of the MBS alumni to, to help our community. Um, and thank you to the audience for your questions. Helen, Michael, Letitia, Damien, I see there are some questions of yours there. We will endeavour to still answer them and share our responses via email as a follow-up. You will also get a link to a survey um, immediately after this, just so that we can keep hearing from you in terms of what you'd like to hear more about. And just as we wrap up, um, if you've enjoyed this session, we have other webinars and series that um, you can be uh, coming along to and listening in on, including the three that are on the screen. So on the 15th of July, we have um, Ofer Yom Tov, who's the Chief Design Officer from ANZ, talking with my colleague, Greg Carbage, on how to champion human-centered design. We have um, another, oh, the screen's gone funny, but we have an, if you go to um, mbs.edu slash events, you will see um, all our upcoming events, including those this month. So thank you very much for your time and for your questions, and we look forward to seeing you next time.